The Linux Action Show is created by Jupiter Broadcasting. It's sponsored by Ting. Go to last.ting.com to save off your first device or plan and DigitalOcean. Go over to digitalocean.com and use our promo code LASTDIGITAL and then you can spin up your own Linux rig for free. Welcome to Linux Action Show, episode 382. My name is Chris. And my name is Noah. Hey, Noah, guess what? Big show today. Well, and I'm surprised, actually, because I thought that we're going to have nothing to talk about at the end of August, going into early September. Now, mid-September is like the whole, like, vacation phase and school starting up. It's like dead zone. Dead zone. But Noah had a little conflict in his life this week, and, well, we're going to make lemonade out of those lemons and make show content. After years of struggle... Noah is dropping Gmail like it's hot. Dropped Gmail like it's hot. And we're going to tell you what he switched to, why. Plus, we're also going to cover some other great open source solutions and one I'm considering as well. Then in the news segment, we're going to talk about Dell dropping the XPS 13. We're going to give a little shout out to the new Flowblade video editor and also Mozilla's data hack. What happened there if it really is an issue that the press is making it out to? And also an update on stage fright, which is now gone. Public. And then in the uh, latter half of the show, we've got some great feedback, some interesting follow-up. But before all of that, Noah, you know what we do have right here, right now? We have picks! We do have picks. This first pick is um, epic because uh, this is a big deal. The Shanghai subway system runs Linux. Uh, this came in from uh, Dasty, I believe is how we say his name. He says, hi guys, for five years I've been living in Shanghai and I suddenly discovered that Ubuntu is running on the streaming TVs and TVs... <laughs> in the Shanghai subway system. And he includes some links that we'll have in the show notes if you guys want to take pictures of it. Uh, and he also said, here's a link to the incredible expansion of the Shanghai subway system, which is just really, truly remarkable. And so these displays, Noah, are positioned uh, throughout the subway system. And uh, for the whole time, I guess he didn't know that they were running on, uh, on Linux, but he got a chance to grab us a picture of it. What do you think of this? It's always really cool when you go in and see these little display things that are running Linux. But typically, what we found in the past is that they are embedded Linux, right? So it's some custom solution specifically built on some custom, and they just simply use the Linux kernel to get what they want done done. In this particular case, they're actually running Ubuntu, or at least it looks like they're running Ubuntu. So that's a little cooler that they're actually using like a mainstream desktop distribution, and then obviously they probably have some some uh, fancy schmancy software on top of it. Yeah. So that stood out to me as really cool. But the other thing is like the more that people send in these runs Linux, and the more I see that in like Every single restaurant and every single, uh, apparently, subway system <laughs> that uses these embedded things are running Linux. I think it would almost be more interesting to try to find ones that aren't running Linux. Because it seems like they're <laughs> few and far between. There was a time when I remember, I remember a time in my career where we would sit down and they would say, well, we have, uh, you know, at the time it was XP. They'd say, we have Windows XP for desktops and we have Windows XP embedded for devices like in restaurants and, and movie theaters and stuff like that. And, and I wonder how true that is anymore. The, the, I have one client that I know that has uh, XP embedded and that's on their ATMs, which is a funny story in and of itself. Everything else has transitioned to uh, to Linux-based solutions, and that isn't even because of me. That is, that was the the product that came to market that they decided to go with. It just happens to run Linux. Well, that was the point I was going to pick up from. Is you know, when I see these pictures, I wonder how much is it really the subway administration or IT department making these decisions, and right. how much is it the vendor that's creating the solution they're buying? Mm -hmm. And I bet mm -hmm. that's more of the story. And that's why it's based on Ubuntu is because the developers that are writing that that UI and that and that interface, they're using Ubuntu on their development machines. That's why those yep. terminals are probably using Ubuntu. Right. I also, right. You, know, you know what the next thing that comes to my mind is? Hmm. How likely is it they're doing security updates on those? Almost 100% they're not. They must have some sort of connectivity to get updated programming. I doubt mm -hmm. it's, it's traditional television. It's probably more some sort of IP delivery since they're underground. Right. So they must have network connectivity, but yeah, I doububt they're getting the latest updates. <laughs> no, no, I know they, they probably aren't. But then again, you have to think of the, the practical perspective of that too. If somebody compromises the display system in the subway, I, I get the whole escalation, yeah. you know, yeah. and that it's yeah, yeah. it could be tied in what with another network. Do? That is more important. I guess what you could do is you could you could propagate false information, like you know, there's been an attack or something like that. Or yeah, yeah, you could do little stuff like that. Or uh, more realistically, let's face it: if somebody actually finds a security method, we all know it's going to happen. They're going to put boobs on or the thing say. when yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right, or goatsy, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, is that really something we're going to get really that upset no, about? No, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. <clears throat> You know, I guess this is what Mark Shuttleworth would tell you that Ubuntu Snappy is here to solve, Noah. So then they could just uh, do uh, uh, yeah. uh, safe, uh, secure updates. Well, you know, another thing they could try is uh, DigitalOcean. Maybe they could just host the whole infrastructure on DigitalOcean. Why? Because it's simple cloud hosting. 
and they're dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up your own cloud server. And the nice thing about DigitalOcean is the interface is really, really intuitive. So doing things like snapshots and backups is one button click, easy, dead simple. And that way, if you want to make a big change, you don't end up regretting it if something doesn't work out because you just revert your snapshot right back. The other nice thing is you can deliver those snapshots off to somebody else. So, uh, for example, we use DigitalOcean droplets to power some back-end services that we use on many of our shows for Jupiter Broadcasting. But I don't have the time to manage all of those systems. Um, but I do want to have uh, the ability to, to own that data and, and take over the system if that community member no longer wants to participate in the community. And, you know, for a lot of reasons, people just move on, things like that. And so I like the option of being able to pick up if they move on. So the way you can do that is you can set up a monthly snapshot, either using their straightforward API or their great interface, and then deliver that snapshot off to the owner or the person you're working with or the project lead or whatever the scenario is, the client. And then they have a copy of it. You're guaranteeing them a copy of the work while you leave the other one in production. It's a neat way to use their system. It's a little unconventional. But here's the best part. If you use our promo code, you can get a $10 credit. Our promo code is last digital. One word, lowercase, last digital. You'll get a $10 credit over at DigitalOcean. Now, here's the cool thing. Their standard rig is only $5 a month. And for $5 a month, you get 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte. A terabyte of transfer. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. I've never really tapped that out. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, and Germany. And man, do they. And their interface is really worth you checking out just on its own. So use our promo code LASTDIGITAL and try it out. And don't forget, DigitalOcean also pays authors for their technical uh, um, articles. You have to check out, see what they have going. They also often have positions open, and they love to hire from the Jupiter Broadcasting community. Go over to their community page, too, and check out some of their more recent tutorials. I love, how do, I love this one. How do you set up Apache virtual hosts on Ubuntu 14.04? Man, you don't even need to be a DigitalOcean customer to take advantage of that one. You can go to DigitalOcean.com, use the promo code LASTDIGITAL. They got all the distros you'd probably want. I mean, maybe. You gotta try it. I, I recommend trying CoreOS for a little while. DigitalOcean.com, use the promo code LASTDIGITAL and give it a go. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring. All right, Mr. Noah, so uh, you submitted into our desktop app pick this week, which will now go down in history, the hall of app picks at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash last picks. You submitted a show, it to the show, a text editor. You, sir, are ballsy. It's called yeah. Light Table. Tell me about this. So every once in a while, I come across a, a tool or a program that <clears throat> I probably personally wouldn't use, but it looks really cool. And so then I have to dig into it just because it's a tool on Linux and I should know about it. And as I'm watching the video, which is linked there in the show notes, it, it, it stood out to me as if I was the kind of person that did web development, I think this would be really cool. Yeah. I don't know that that's the case because I don't do web <laughs> development and I, I don't even really write code. So I, I can't even, the closest I've come to writing code, Chris, is I work on the show notes and I do that in G Editor. I'm trying to use more and more Haru pad so I mess, make less and less. Uh, Which you must have not used mistakes. today then. No, I did not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was okay. doing it on my laptop in my car, actually. All right, but, very good. Uh, <laughs> so apparently there, there, there are some, but the, uh, but this is the, the tool. I think part of it is just that there is that square that spins around constantly. And it, again, it's linked in the show notes. So you can go watch the video. But the apparently all the changes that you make to the web page are then or the or the uh, components of the web page rather are then rendered on on the right hand of the screen, kind of like a Rupad does for Markdown and. I would have a lot of fun just making that little spinning box. I would have fun creating that and then just tweaking it. I think that would be really cool. Um, but the the tool just has a really nice UI. And and one of the things that I've noticed, not necessarily um, from writing code, but doing other things like working inside of the terminal, is the nicer my screen looks and if the colors uh, you know are, are pleasant to my eyes, I can actually get more work done because I can stand to, to look longer at the screen. And it, it's actually something that came to me after a number of years of, of, of working with just the default that you know they used to have, especially in, in CentOS and Red Hat, they have the, the bright white background with the black text. And I could only look at that so long and do so much work before I just kind of had to take a break and I just got fatigued. And ever since I've switched to more of a, a, a darker interface, um, that has helped me work longer. And this seems to hit on a number of those same aesthetic things I liked um, about my terminal. So I assume if you're a web editor, this would be a really cool thing to play with. Yeah, the uh, I was going to say, you know, these are really great, even if you're just doing Markdown, just the, help, the helpful syntax highlighting. Boy, is there so many different options in this area right now, you know, specifically for Markdown Harupad. Uh, Adam also has some good stuff. But I noticed when I was digging around in this, Noah, they talk about having Markdown support in this thing. So this is a, it's an open source editor, just like you probably would come to expect. 
It supports plugins, um, and they were one of the top ten Kickstarters. So they uh, they came from crowdfunding. Um, so it's worth checking out, I'd say. Neither one of us have actually used it. I did install and play with it a little bit. Yeah. I just don't trust my... I don't trust anything that I, I, I've gained from it because as as a non-web developer, I, I feel weird going and saying, I tried it and I really liked it. Of course, I don't know what I'm doing in it. So yeah, I it doesn't really mean, mean anything. Yeah, no, I follow but what you I, But I did, I did install it and play with it. it. It does, it looks very, very nice and it looks very, very, uh, very aesthetically pleasing. I can yeah. say that. I like the way it looks too. So I'm going to, actually, I'm going to give it, a, I just downloaded it right now. I'm going to give it a go because I figure, well, why the heck not? So mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure uh, if you, let's see if you download it. It looks like it just, uh, looks like you can just download a binary if you want. You don't even have to download a package. Is that what you did too? Uh, I did, yeah. I, and the machine I was using actually was Ubuntu. I would imagine if you're on an Arch machine, you might be able to get it in the AUR, no? I'm gonna, I'll give it a go. So I downloaded it here and, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. I'll try it for a bit. You know what I could do actually, which is sometimes is actually not a bad way to uh, give these things a good, a decent test is to just drop the show notes in there and uh, just see what it does with those. So I'm going to, we'll see. I'm I just I'm launching it right now, and I'll give it a run, and I'll report back uh, maybe at the top of the news segment. Yeah, it is. It does look like it's in the AOR as well. I would imagine so, but I already downloaded the uh, the what am I call it? So you want me to? I'll do it right now. You want me to do it right now? No, I'm crazy like that. Right. I'll launch it right, right. now. Here well, I go. If you're crazy cray enough, let me see. Let me see. I see. Uh, just see what's it called? The the, uh, the executable is called. Uh, oh well, guess what? Light table. That makes sense, doesn't it? That would. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Big show. Big show. Big show. Boom! I just launched it. The fun begins. It's uh, no nobody. I don't think I don't think everyone has a full appreciation of the risk you're taking on right now. Why is that? Well, I don't what, know, what just you launching, mean? just launching a, a launching a pro. Who knows what's going to happen? Well, who does know? Here, so I'm pasting in the markdown right now. But so far, it's not super. Like uh, it doesn't like realize. I bet, I bet I have to save the file first before it. Uh, so I'll do this. Yeah. So I'll just try test dot md. There we go. Now I'm getting syntax highlighting. Yeah. So now, okay. There you go. So this is something. This is it's all right, Noah. <laughs> yeah, you don't like I it. Don't, you don't like it. I don't but, love but it. But if you if you go if you go back after the show's over and you go back in the show notes and you look at the the little video link and you watch that spinning box, I'm gonna change your mind, sir. Actually, you know what? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you something else, Noah. I mean, there's, I'll give it this. This is just my you know right off the cuff impressions playing with it here. Mm -hmm. It feels a lot faster than Adam and Haru pad. Hmm. It, it seems like it's more performance. So I bet it's not. I bet it's not like a Chromium app running on like a. Like a jig, like a whatever the hell it is they run. Like like Harupad is and and Adam run on top of uh, run run on top or basically Chrome apps. Hmm. And uh, I do, this does not feel like that. This feels I don't know if that's true or not, but this feels faster. So that's I'll give it that. That it does feel very snappy. So I, oh, and here's the plugins directory. It makes it really obvious how to get to that. As a built-in update checker. All right, I'm gonna keep playing with it for the rest of the episode. I'll do I'll do the rest of the show notes out of that for the rest of the show. Maybe I'll report back in the feedback segment. Just remind me. So there you go. All right, I wanted to give a shout out. So uh, my, I, I, uh, I wanted to submit into the uh, spotlight this week an editor that I have a lot of enthusiasm for. One that I actually have only gotten to try a few times. Uh, <clears throat> and they just did a huge update on the 9th of this week. It's Flowblade. Flowblade has been updated, and the big change here has been ported to GTK3. Now, you don't get a ton of stuff with this port, but uh, they go on to say, by the way, in the project... I'll tell you what you get with it, but the one thing, this is a side note by the developer, they say the process was not as straightforward as one might think, but eventually everything worked out. There always seemed to be just one more little change in the API that required all instances to be fixed by hand. Luckily, there were, cause there were conversion scripts available that did most of the grunt work in getting things going. We did get something in return. Small but perceptible responsive improvements were gained, probably because GTK provides a Cairo widget for creating custom widgets that is now used instead of the project-specified Cairo widget. It was used before. GTK3 also seems to render widgets a bit crisper. Uh, so it goes on with a few other notes. I, uh, he says all rendering was moved out of process as in process rendering was found not to work correctly. That's great. That should dramatically improve UI responsiveness, I would think. Dark theme support, Noah, for you was improved. Mm -hmm. Heyo. And also, Noah, yeah, I know one of your rigs has a like a kind of like a 768 screen. They yep. the, he specifically did small screen support to help improve. Uh, on low res video editing. That's awesome. Yeah, in fact, if you look, the majority of laptops today are still shipping with 13, uh, 1366 by 768. 
That's a crime against humanity. Well, it is what it is. If you go in, if you go into the store, the chances of you walking out with a laptop with a screen re resolution higher than that are slim to none. And the chances of you walking out with a screen resolution higher than that and not spending over a thousand dollars are practically non-existent. The the thing that I that that I took away from Flowblade is kind of the same view I have on OpenShot and 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 and, and Caden Live. If you're doing home videos, it seems amazing. It seems like if you were going to put this into a professional setting, it just doesn't seem like it has the interface to compete with the premieres and the and and, and the Final Cut Pros. Oh, I agree there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about the GDK three version. Uh, that might be worth another look. Uh, you know, I, I I this I would love to. I would love for this to be the editor that I use on the road trip. Oh yeah, no, that'd be because cool. I'm going to produce really it. Yeah, cool. right. Yeah, I know because I don't need a lot for those videos, and I'm yeah. going to. I basically just need to be able to do cut transitions, add mm -hmm. text, and some music, mm -hmm. and I'm good to go. The thing is, I'm checking right now, but I believe the version of Flowblade. See, we we're talking about the our choose repository earlier. Uh, the version of Flowblade, yeah, in the AUR is old. <clears throat> it's like really old. It's 1.0. If you are listening and. Uh, you could get that updated in the next couple of days. I would use this editor on the road, uh, but I want to try the uh, GTK free version. Yeah, I have I have a lot of hopes for an open source video editor. And, and you know, I can do video editing on Linux. And if, even if I look aside from the horrendous workflow that that is Lightworks, the problem I'm still left with is that they're not in any real appreciable way open source. Uh, it runs on Linux, so that's cool. And they they call it open mm. source, and that's kind of cute. But there's Find me that the source adorable. code, send it to me. It's, it's, yeah. You're not going to be able to do it. And so I would love an alternative. So far, I haven't found one. At least that doesn't, at least that has the same functionality that I've had in Lightworks. So uh, let me uh, let everybody give an, I want to give everybody an update on the first meetup we've uh, officially locked in on the road trip. It's right here in Washington. <clears throat> so that's why it was so easy to lock in so early. Uh, it's the Spokane meetup. If you're going to be in the Spokane area of Washington, go to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. Go there anyways and let us know because once we hit the road, uh, we're going to be doing meetups as we stop in different places. And, we, you know, that's going to be a little bit on the fly. So there's a couple of ways if you want to meet up with us. I'm going to be taking uh, I-90 to Noah's house, which is in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And so between uh, the uh, Pacific Ocean and Grand Forks, North Dakota on the I-90 stretch, if you're in that area and would like to meet up, go to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. And also <clears throat> something else that I'm introducing so you can live track us. Uh, there will be, and also uh, follow all of the content that is produced on the road trip that is available to everyone. Um, there's going to be some exclusive content just for the patrons, uh, but there's going to be uh, public content and a live tracker of the road trip at uh, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash rover, which is jupiterbroadcasting.com slash rover, where you'll be able to find a live map. And with that also, we had, a, we had some voting on what we should call uh, the uh, mobile studio. And uh, the, the results are so far are, are pretty conclusive. I'm going to put the uh, poll in the chat room right now and give folks another chance. I'll also have a link in the show notes for people that aren't watching live. But Noah, right now, here, uh, here were our different contenders. We had Jupiter Rover, Voyager 1, Galileo, Nomad Burrito, the Podcast Yacht, the Pioneer, and the Flirty Bird. And so far, out of 175 votes, Jupiter Rover is pulling ahead at 45%, which is not bad, right? Yeah, that, was, that, that, was, that was my vote. Oh, you, oh, oh no! Vote. Was I not supposed to say that? <laughs> I don't know. Our jeez, I think uh, it's people of the station. What, what do they always say on radio shows when they're doing giveaways? Uh, what are they? Uh, station personnel are not allowed to participate in that. Oh, I yeah. don't know. Oh, yeah. well, nobody told me that, and I saw it in the show notes. No, I'm it's like, fine. Oh, screw that! I want to vote. Oh, you got the, you did it from the show notes. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, the Jupiter Rover kind of seems to be the winner right now. So I set up Jupiter Broadcasting Rover. I suppose I could always change it if a different name comes ahead. But the rover, the rover site is, I got a dedicated piece of hardware that'll allow you guys to track where we're going in real time. And so if we're in your town, you'll be able to tweet me or something like that. And uh, also, hopefully, uh, we have a volunteer, Odyssey Westra, who's, uh, uh, oh, Odyssey points out there's also forms on the meetup page. Odyssey, uh, I haven't, uh, I haven't um, we haven't locked in a full system yet, but he's going to help me organizing some of the meetups as well. So he might be a point of contact in the chat room or on the Google Plus community page where he's often at. And I may even give him the ability to track me in real time and get notifications as I'm arriving in areas so he could preemptively set things up if he wants. It's really neat. So the, the, uh, the road show is getting close. Next week's episode will be from the road. That's how close it is. On the 19th is when I head out. So, I... so you're going to take, take 90 to 94? Yeah, probably. Okay. Um, 
I'm, I'm, that's my current plan. Uh, it kind of depends on if we end up deviating slightly to meet up with people or not. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then I may, I may improvise a little bit at the end there. But yeah, 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 yeah. I think we won't bother going all the way up to Highway Two or anything like that at that point. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. No, you know, I've been staying in the trailer since Labor Day weekend, like Full continually. Time. You didn't know that? No kid. Well, I knew that you were taking trips in it. I didn't realize that it was like that was the... Well, I guess you did. You know, I, sh- I guess I should just read more carefully. I guess your telegram did say I've basically moved in full time to the trailer. Yeah, well, I had a lot to learn. Like, I still have a lot to learn. Uh-huh. And I'm like, there's like, uh, there's been challenges that I didn't expect and uh, things like that that I'm really glad I'm not figuring out on the road because I've never owned an RV or a yeah, trailer before. So, so, so back me up on this. If anyone is ever thinking about buying an RV, the most beneficial thing you can do is ask the RV de- dealership if you can stay in it for a night or two in their lot. Yeah, no you kidding. Because you immediately will pick out all of the things you like or don't like about that particular RV. I'll tell you that the big thing that hits me that I would do anything to do over again is... Our RV on the on on the on the campsite side, so where the door is, we have no like big window. There's just a, there's just a small one, and of course that's where you like all the parks and all the places that are mm. set up. The beautiful views are always, for obvious reasons, out the same side as the camper is the door, and we don't have that, so we don't have a big window. And so if I want to look out, I have to open the door and just use the screen door. And then yeah. if, if but my next RV will definitely have a big window on that side of the RV. Yeah, yeah, there there are a few things, but you know I'm pretty happy with this trailer so far, and it's a, it's a good uh, it's a good first uh, first trailer for me. Um, and uh, I have I've been I've I've posted like I think three updates now on on the whole thing and some of the challenges I ran into. Mm-hmm. Like um, uh, I, I I after having the water hooked up to the trailer for a few days, I started uh, pulling really hard on the connector. Like I could, there was a lot of strain on the connector on the on the RV, and it was starting to leak a lot. Mm-hmm. So I had to pick up an elbow joint and things like that. Anyways, it's been fun. And uh, I'll have I'll have videos eventually posted at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash rover and contact info. We're going to set up a dedicated email address, which will likely be rover at jupiterbroadcasting.com. So if you have um, RV and trailer and roadshow specific email and feedback, you can send it there. Because um, apparently, so uh, Angela was here last night for the faux show. Mm-hmm. And she says to me, she says, I need you to set up a dedicated email address for the trailer. <laughs> I said, what? And she's like, yeah, we're getting so much email and people are sending it to general comments that I don't know what to do with it because people are fascinated by the topic. Essentially, you have you have combined two entire interest groups, right? You have a bunch of people that maybe they don't even care about Linux, but they really like their RVs. And then you have all the people that really like RVs that don't or really like Linux that don't really care if it's an RV or otherwise. And then you have the people like me that like both. It's appealing too because there's a wide range of gadgets, and mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. there's a it's a it's an interesting mix of maker solutions too. Yes, which yes, is really appealing. And there's like no there's sometimes multiple correct ways to do something. I would say there's always multiple correct ways to do. I mean, there's very few things in the camper that you have to do one way. And like you said, it is very maker centric. It is very centered around people with a creative mind that want to creatively solve problems. Which, if you think about it. Fits really well with the whole open source idea, And right? then I'm looking at, like, the underseat storage, and I'm like, I could build a little Linux file yep. media server and put it yeah. in here. And, like, yeah. and then I'm dude. starting to... <laughs> dude, I did... <laughs> so I don't have a Linux file. I haven't gotten that deep, but I did... I, I am working on, for mine, a, a TV with one of my Western Digitals mounted on the back, mm. and then one of those 128-gig USB sticks that are stuck in there. So we've got local media, so I don't have to worry about having internet to be able to watch, because I can fit a lot of movies and TV shows. This is what I need to do, because mm. I'm already burning through data like a like a maniac up there. Yeah. I was telling you on the pre-show, I've already used 2.5 gigabytes of data and I haven't even left for the road trip yet. Yeah. So that's definitely now local media. And so now I'm thinking, you know, that, like how do, how do I do ethernet in this thing? Like, do mm-hmm. I want to do ethernet? Do I need to since it's such a mm-hmm. small space? Like mm-hmm. Wi-Fi could actually be a, a, a reliable solution. I don't know. It's a bunch of, it's a bunch of fun technical challenges. So I, but I obviously doesn't all fit in here. So I put them out in separate videos and you guys can check them out. And I'll tell you about some of it as we hit the road. It's going to be an interesting challenge figuring out how to do some of these broadcasts from the road, try to make it sound good and all of that. And hopefully you'll be patient with us as we work that out. And then eventually, so next week's episode, I'll be on the road. I'll probably either be in Idaho or just or just into Montana. Probably Idaho on Sunday, I would think. And then, um, and then uh, on the next Linux Action Show, if everything works out, I'll be arriving in Noah's neck of the woods around Friday or Friday, so we'll be doing mm-hmm. it. We'll either be doing it Friday or Sunday from Noah's house. I'm not exactly sure how the time it'll work out. So you'll my just house? have to. We're gonna do it from my house or wherever we're doing it. I don't know. Oh, okay. No, Where are I, we doing we it, could from? Do it from? No, we could do it from my house. Well, we got to do the cribs thing at some point. Yeah. Well, yeah, we have to. We have to film that. The thing is, if if we do it at my house, I have to make sure to kick my family out. 
because <laughs> they're loud. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Whatever you want to <laughs> do. As you it. can imagine. No, it doesn't matter. I, I, I can care. Skype in from the trailer. <laughs> Whatever works for you, let's, Noah. Let's introduce as many problems as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right, we'll figure that out off the air. That's something, that's that's a problem for future Noah and Chris. Right now, let's do the news. Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by... Ting.com. Hey, everybody, go to last.ting.com. Why don't you go there right now, chat room, go there right now and check them out and try that savings calculator because Ting is neat. It's my mobile service provider, and it's Noah's mobile service provider because it's mobile that makes sense. No contract, no early termination fees, and all the phones are unlocked. And it's really cool because you get maximum control with their control panel, and their support is live and no hold when you call them between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. East Coast time at 1-855-TING-FTW. Here's the best part. You only pay for what you use. It's flat $6 for the line. And then your usage on top of that. It's really that simple. Go to last.ting.com to get a $50 discount. This only lasts through September. Or if you bring a compatible Ting phone or some uh, on select Ting devices, you'll get a $50 credit. Now, I'm thinking that's probably going to pay for your first two months. Maybe, maybe not. Kind of depends on your usage, but it definitely would have mine. Uh, my first month didn't even crack $25. So if you go to last.ting.com, you can take advantage of the $50 promo that we have going. Go knock some money off some of those great devices. Also, Ting has crazy deals going on right now. So go over to their site and check out their blog. They have some September deals. SIM cards are down to $5 right now. That's a nice deal. Free shipping site-wide. They have the Kyocera Kona, which is a great feature phone. $20 off. It's $68. No contract. Only pay for what you use. How about the Samsung Galaxy S3? Fifty dollars off. You can get a Samsung Galaxy S3, hundred and twenty-two dollars for, for you know if you don't need the latest and greatest smartphone. No contract, no early termination fee. If you do need the latest and greatest smartphone, they're taking eighty bucks off the Samsung Galaxy S6. That's a powerhouse of a phone with no contract, no termination fees, only paying for what you use. Forty-five dollars off the Blue Studio 6.0. Look at that sucker. That's nice. They have a bunch of other great devices, including data-only devices, which I'll be using on my road trip. Go to last.ting.com and check them out. That supports this show. Also, try out their savings calculator and see if they make sense for you. It's worth a shot. Last.ting.com. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. I got to uh, I gotta say, I'm, uh, I'm very thankful to Ting. They're going to be providing data on the, uh, the road trip, Noah. And I hope, I hope with CDMA and GSM, I'm going to have pretty good coverage. You know, that has been my new my new thing. <clears throat> For a long time, I've kind of railed against GSM because of the security implications and stuff. And after <clears throat> I was essentially forced to go back to GSM because of the, the phone I was using in, the, the, in my area, and I have re-fallen in love with GSM, I feel like I actually own my phone again. <clears throat> and part of that is, part of it is because I know I can take it to another carrier, I can take it to any GSM character carrier. So buying an unlocked GSM phone is like buying the universal standard, if you will, of cell phones versus the CDMA version is locked to one network or the other. But the other thing is because the service is so cheap with Ting, I found myself like, I'm like, I wonder if I could do this with GSM. Did you know they make GSM pagers? So well, you can buy a, a GSM pager and put a, just put a Ting GSM card in there, and then we have an extension set up on our phone system now. When you call the whoever, whoever is on call, rather than ringing the cell phone and, and, and it goes to a call center and then they generate a little text message and send it off, it just, whatever that person says, it goes into a little pre-voice recording and then the pager goes off and you can hit play. And that has been a really great way to have like the red phone or the hot potato or whatever you want to call it for a call-out phone. Um, in addition to... I found a way that you can buy GSM modems. So I can buy a little GSM yeah, modem, stick a GSM buddy. card in there, and then I can plug that into any of our routers. So if we lose internet and it's really, really important, I mean, we're going to pay for some data, but we can get that place back up and running. Like everything I can think of, somebody makes it, but it exists now in GSM. Now combine that with a Raspberry Pi and you're really cooking. It's yeah, really yeah, cool. exactly, exactly. <laughs> Last.ting.com and a big thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the Dell XPS 13. Uh, in Europe, it's no longer available for sale. Dell is taking it off the market, Noah. They've taken it off the market. You know why? I don't. Because it sold so damn well. Uh, they've already run through their forecasted inventory. They sold it better than they expected. The U.S. still has inventory on hand. And a, uh, a, a Dell employee, I believe, is the one that made this comment. They said, uh, unfortunately, Europe has already run through their forecasted inventory. Uh, thanks for the support. They have a new XPS 13 in development, they say, with rumored USB-C connector for power and whatnot. How about that? 
Would that sweeten the deal for you? So, you know, you and I often talk about the quote-unquote perfect Linux laptop. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things I know that's recently got shown up on your list since the Pixel introduced it is USB-C. Yep. Uh, what are you thinking, Noah? My body is ready for USB-C. Yeah. And I don't think, un, un, I don't think until, you, uh, uh, until you sit down and think about all the problems that you have that could be solved by USB-C. I'll give you a couple examples. I live for my docking connector on the bottom of my computer, so much so that I try a bunch of different laptops. I need another laptop like I need a hole in the head, but my main laptop where I get work done will have a dock connector on it or I won't use it. And the reason for that is, is because when I'm sitting at my office, I have a really big display that I really like. I have a keyboard that I really like. I have a specific mouse I really like. I have my printer and all of that stuff is connected. And I just want to walk in in the morning and set my laptop down and I want it to charge and be connected to all those peripherals. Well, the problem is with a dock connector is you basically, you basically uh, sell yourself on a half inch or an inch laptop if you're going to have a dock connector. I, it's just the way it is because they don't make laptops that, right. that are super thin that have dock connectors. You just can't physically fit it in there. Right. And USB-C allows you to have all the functionality of a dock connector without having a dock connector, just a single cable. Never mind the fact that it allows it to, you can plug it in any which way you want and it will work on every laptop. We've essentially standardized the power connector for laptops, which in my estimation is about 20 years overdue. Um, so yeah, I'm hugely excited for USB-C and I do think that if, if, if they're going to double down on the XPS, I do think it makes for an excellent, if not the perfect Linux laptop. I agree. The other thing that's kind of cool about a lot of USB-C devices is the charging can go both ways. You can plug a smartphone that has USB-C into a laptop that has potentially a larger battery and start charging it, um, or, or vice versa. And the other thing that you got to figure is if you have one of those large external battery packs, you could charge a laptop with USB-C using that, Yep. which is yep. really nice. So there is a story going around that is kind of unfortunate, and it, it's a little complicated, and it involves Mozilla's uh, Bugzilla database getting hacked. And the way it happened is the unfortunate part, because it kind of ends up looking bad for Mozilla, and it wasn't really their fault. So here's the story over at ours. An attacker sold security-sensitive vulnerability information from Mozilla's bug tracking system and probably used it to attack Firefox users. That's Mozilla's assumption, even. In a fact, published alongside Mozilla's blog post about the attack, the company added that the loss of information appeared to stem from a privileged user's compromised account. The user appeared to have reused their Bugzilla account on another website which suffered a data breach. The attacker then allegedly gained access to the sensitive Bugzilla account and was able to download security sense information about the flaws in Firefox and other Mozilla products. Uh, in other words, because a privileged user in the Bugzilla database had an account at another site that got hacked and used the same username and password, they were able to just go log in over at Mozilla. And the, and the kind of stuff that they got taken, were taken was stuff that was severe vulnerabilities that hadn't yet been disclosed. The attacker accessed 185 non-public Firefox bugs, of which 53 involved severe vulnerabilities. Ten of the vulnerabilities were unpatched at the time, while the remainder had been fixed the most recent version of Firef- in the most recent version. Of the ten unpatched bugs, the company believes the attacker used one to exploit a Firefox vulnerability. Mozilla wrote about that vulnerability at the beginning of August, warning users that an advertisement on a new site in Russia was serving a Firefox exploit that searched for sensitive files and uploaded them to a server that appeared to be in the Ukraine. The vulnerability was patched in August. We talked about it in TechSnap. But uh, this is interesting, the, the concept of the Bugzilla database sort of being used against the project because not of any necessarily, necessarily any flaw in the Bugzilla software or Mozilla security practices, but simply because an important user used the same credentials somewhere else. And I just... I know how many, I know I've said it before, but you know, something like KeyPass or LastPass solves mm-hmm. these problems. Doesn't solve all of the problems, but it would have solved this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I have had so much of the opposite problem that I've almost kind of gone the other way. Everything you're told in school when you go through, especially when, when I went through my, my, my certified ethical hacker course and, and stuff like that, everything they talk about talks about having, um, separate credentials and stuff like that. And in practice, what I found is I run into, and we talked about this informally uh, in your truck uh, on, on the interstate at one point where I said, the number of times where LastPass has kept me from signing into something mm-hmm. super important and, and it has literally cost me money, mm-hmm. I can I have at least one of those a week. On the other hand, the amount of times that any of my accounts have been, have been, have been compromised are slim to none. And so I've kind of adopted almost kind of a, almost kind of a, uh, a hybrid in that 
I will try to keep separate passwords for different accounts, but they're just, it's one like main thing with slight little tweaks to it. And then the, the little tweaks that relate to whatever the site I'm, I'm accessing. And that way I can memorize the password while still having different passwords for every site. Cause what I'm finding is tr trusting a piece of software to, to, to remember all of my passwords just isn't working for me in the practical sense. Yeah, man, I hate to, I hate to say I agree with you, but I, if I'm being completely honest and, uh, and saying, and, and actually, you know, admitting to what I practice, I too, to a certain degree, like almost out of requirement of, of, you know, like sharing accounts, like the Pandora account with my spouse, or like, how do you do that without having a password that both of you can memorize? And then by the way, one that you have to tap in like an animal on the Roku or whatever you want to set up your Pandora streaming account on. That's a crappy UI device that was never meant to input that kind of, you know, crazy characters from a password. Like, you guess just by the nature, or or hell, just log, you know, if you both want to log into the same Pandora account on your smartphones and tap it out on the smartphone, you don't want to have some crazy 12-character randomly generated monster. You know, it's just not practical. So the nature of the beast almost forces us to have, like, this hybrid approach where, like, the stuff I really care about, those have unique passwords. And then the other stuff that, well, I could afford to have compromised, but it would sort of upset me. And, and how many times in a given weekend am I like, oh, let's go do this. And you're like, oh, yeah. And then I hand you a laptop and you're like, oh, ugh, can't do that. I have to last pass right. this, that, or the other. And it's like, oh, well, I guess that's not going to work. The biggest scare I ever got was when I almost forgot to uh, set up two-factor authentication on my new phone before I got rid of my old phone. And I only had two-factor on one machine. I almost get, got rid of it. You know what? I bit that bullet. I have one of those t-shirts and it's not that bad. You, what you end up doing is resetting every password on every account and uh, oh my it gosh. sucks, but it's, it's doable. I, I, I did the exact same thing. Whoa. And yeah, no, yeah. I thankfully didn't yeah. do that part. I, no, I got my no, two factor. I did. Been there, done so that. So you've really been burned by this then. So you're, you're the, you're this guy. You're the guy that, yeah. Okay. So you're the guy everybody's going to hack now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Everyone's trying in the chat room. If you haven't noticed to guess my pattern. Yeah. So. Right. I guess. So, uh, anyways, you can't really blame Mozilla for this, but, uh, unfortunately the way the headline goes and because it looks like the access may have dated as far back as September, 2013, 2013. So they may have been getting zero days to use against Firefox users for a couple of years. It's just horrible. Just horrible. All right, so uh, I want to while we're while we're talking about security, I want to talk about uh, something that is a little unfortunate because Linux is is such a great platform for keeping yourself secure and safe, and so it's really unfortunate when a platform vendor comes along and really messes that aspect of Linux up. And so to see the stage fright bug continue to be an issue that Google has not properly addressed, none of the OEMs have properly addressed, and now exploit code is out in the wild. So I don't know if you are familiar with Stage Fright, but uh, Stage Fright is a flaw in devices, I believe, uh, Android 5.0 and earlier, which is, you know, basically the entire market, if you don't have a Nexus device. Uh, it's a flaw where a malformed MP4 file can overtake your entire device. You can, you can overtake a... Oh, is that all? Yeah, with a, just an MP4 file. And that MP4 file could be from a web page that you get the user to click on. It could be attached to an email. It could be sent via an SMS, which, by the way, also works with another flaw that is, a t that is in the way Android processes SMS my, uh, files and automatically plays these MP4 files. So if you have an unpatched version of Android for the other flaw and then you get sent one of these mp4 files, it will automatically play it and own your machine for you without the user ever having to do a single thing. So critical flaws reside in the Android Media Library known as Lib Stage Fright, hence the big spooky name Stage Fright. It gives attackers a variety of ways to get code executed on an unsuspecting owner's device. The vulnerabilities were privately reported in April and May, were then publicly disclosed in late July. We've been following it in TechSnap every single week. Google has spent the past four months preparing fixes and distributing them to partners. But those efforts have gotten a number of setbacks. Uh, new versions of Hangouts and Messenger that, that block automatic processing of multimedia files and, that were sent over MMS protocol are basically Band-Aids. So that's one thing users have been able to do. Google and its partners have asked the uh, folks, the researchers that discovered this, to delay it. So they did. But on Wednesday, the company finally published the code. It's a Python script that generates an MP4 media file that exploits the CVE 2015-1538 flaw and gives the attacker reverse command shell on the user's Android device. The attacker is then able to take pictures and remotely listen to audio with an earshot of the microphone. The exploit doesn't work against newer versions of Android 5 and above, 
thanks to the integer overflow mitigations. Not because the flaw does not exist in the OS, but basically because they have integer overflow mitigation techniques in that version of Android. Uh, so remember a couple weeks ago where we were talking about how we don't trust Android? I guess that's not a fair comparison entirely because uh, this could they happen. Say they're gonna, they say they're going to push out you know, monthly fixes to Nexus devices. Yeah, well, that's what about everyone else, though? I know. And, and when, here's the thing. It's not, I mean, just saying Nexus device, that's a little unfair because, like, so the S6 has Android 5, right? In fact, I think they just got 5.1.1 or 5.0.1, whatever it is. Um, but, yeah, the majority of Android devices are still on KitKat. Yeah. Or, uh, earlier. Yeah. Or earlier, yeah. Uh, Google's responded to a lot of the negative press saying that uh, uh, the uh, Nexus devices are going to do a monthly patch. Samsung says they're going to do a similar program for many of the devices. But we don't really know exactly how it's going to work out. Yikes, huh? I mean, th th here's why I put it in the show, this show. This drives me crazy that this is uh, a Linux-based system. Yeah, but so you have, you have the Linux in the aspect of you have the... Uh, you have the kernel, but you don't have Linux in the aspect of, of the, the surrounding community like you'd have with Ubuntu or, I mean, I can't, I can't see this same kind of bug happening with Ubuntu or Fedora, you know, or, or even OpenSUSE or, or any of those distros, right? I mean, I, I think that there's a little bit more oversight, whereas basically we're all kind of waiting for Google to, to fix it. Uh, so the Mycroft project, the artificial intelligence like uh, Amazon uh, Echo competitor we've been talking about has reached funding, and not only that, Noah, not only did it reach its funding goal, but they also reached the stretch goal to get uh, the Mycroft AI released for the Linux desktop. They actually reached $127,000. So we could see the AI, uh, the, uh, AI for uh, Mycroft make it to the desktop and usable. I would love to get a chance to try that on there. Love to. Yeah, that uh, what a, what a cool project to be following from the the inception, right? Especially if it really takes off in the way that I think both you and I think it's going to. And that, and that just becomes like the de facto, you know, AI interface that, that, that integrates with things like home automation, oh, and your man. laptop and your phone. Oh, I mean, man. And, and we were, and you know, and we're right there at the beginning. How cool would that be to look back on? That'd be, that'd be really amazing. Um, and even if it just became the de facto one for just desktop Linux, like, you know, became mm -hmm, like the, mm -hmm. like the new, you know, popular launcher and all that kind of stuff. It'd be really cool to follow it. So I think uh, that's a given, isn't it? Maybe. Th that it's going to become the, because there is, well, there's not, to the best of my knowledge, at least from the perspective of like the voice rec and stuff like that, there's not a whole lot of other competitors on the Linux desktop. Google has something, but yeah, no, well, yeah, I, I think it's, but it's more than just voice recognition, right? That's what's really going to be cool. Yeah. And what can you hook it up to? And what can, what more can you do once you have a full Linux box running on it? Mm -hmm. That could be really impressive. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, congratulations to them. You guys can find out more at mycroft, M-Y-C-R-O-F-T dot A-I if you'd like to find out more. And uh, maybe Ryan can join us on Tuesday's Linux Unplugged if he's around and give us an update uh, like he did before. It's really cool. And we'll have links to all that stuff in the show notes. All right, Noah, that's all the news for this week. This week, Noah got a fire in his belly and decided to leave Gmail in a hot skip and a jump. But we're going to tell you about his solution to replace that sweet, sweet Google Mail solution. But first... I want to tell you about our segment sponsor, and that's System76. Head over to System76.com and get a computer that's been designed, intended to run Linux. That intention makes all of the difference. Check out the Meerkat. That thing is super, super slick, or my favorite, the Rattel Performance. But then if I'm dreaming, if I'm dreaming, if I'm dreaming like a Steven, I would go for the Leopard Extreme or the Silverback Workstation. <laughs> Oh, man, those are some great rigs, and they are all built right here in the U.S. of A, and they run Linux like champs. Also, check out those laptops. They have some great rigs. You can get some portable Linux. You don't have to fight with the hardware or fight with the wireless or fight with the Bluetooth. You get to play with your Linux. Go to System76.com. Get yourself a rig intended to run Linux. Tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. Look, that's all. Man. Oh. Oh, yeah. I got two bonobos right here. One right over there. And right over there. Oh, man. Look at that one. I love that all-in-one, too. That would actually make a pretty good machine for the studio, too. Oh, I love it. System76.com. Go check them out. And a big thanks to System76 for sponsoring this segment. So uh, before we get into Noah's woes, I wanted to give a plug, because uh, since this is the Linux Action Show, and the timing was perfect, uh, Jason over at opensource.com posted on September 10th, so yesterday, uh, five open source alternatives to Gmail. And I want to just round up these super quick for you guys, so that way right at the top of the segment, you know of some great open source options for you. And I love the first one he did, RoundCube. RoundCube is a modern webmail client 
which looks real easy on the ice. Now, you're going to need to have LAMP stack in place, and you're going to need to have a backend mail server for this. But this is a gorgeous web UI, and it's an open source project. Then you have Zimbra. This is one I have a lot of personal experience from a few years ago, but I haven't used it since then. It is a beast. It uses a real boy database, a big boy database behind it. So, like, unlike Exchange, you can just, you know, you have tons and tons of emails you can throw at this thing. It searches super fast. It is a full, full groups collaboration solution. It does calendar, meeting spaces, shared files, uh, notes, all of that. It's a full group where address book, all of that. Zimbra. It's neat. It has a closed source model and an open source model. We've talked about it before. Last, but uh, probably not least, actually, I don't even know if it's last, but it's, it feels old. It's literally been since the 90s, since I've used Squirrel Mail, I think. I'm not joking. Maybe 2000, maybe 2001, but Squirrel Mail is webmail for nuts. It doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles, but it does get the job done. It's written in Alan Jude's favorite language, PHP, and it's licensed under Noah's favorite license, the GPL. So you can check it out, Squirrel Mail. And then let's give Rainloop a shout, because, man, doesn't this thing look nice? It's a modern entry into the webmail arena, and its interface is definitely closer to what you might expect if you're used to Gmail or other commercial clients. Rainloop looks really nice. It's written primarily in PHP. The community edition is licensed under the AGPL, and you can get the source on GitHub, and they also have an online demo at demo.rainloop.net. Oh, man, does that one look good. Check out Kite. That's another good one, too. Also, uh, there's uh, our friends over at the Colab project, and uh, MailPile has an HTML5 client written in Python. Really good write-up that Jason did that talks about all of these things in more detail, and these are some great, great solutions. Noah, you today are here after a week of struggling mm-hmm. with mail, and I'd, I'm right. really curious. I, I, I Basically, these are the highlights I've gotten that you went through some drama, and you have yep. lived this all week, and you're here to tell yep. us your woes and what your solution finally was. Yep. So, uh, as you know, you and I both have individual problems with with Google, basically on a continuing basis. But we both use it because it it is a it is an easy solution. It is an easy enterprise solution that's incredibly cost effective. And I already maintain a mail server for uh, my company, and I am not going to do that for my personal email. <clears throat> I've got enough problems. And enough things to worry about doing that for for our company and doing that for our employees. I'm not doing that for my home, but I want two email addresses. I want to be able to shut off work, <clears throat> and I want to to only know about personal things from family members mm-hmm. and important things that come in. And so I have the way that I have my my mail client set up. I have to intentionally go pull my work email, but all of my personal stuff, which is I consider to be a higher priority, comes automatically and it's checked every minute or three minutes or whatever the lowest increment I can set in uh, in Android is. And so I have I I, start, I originally I switched to Gmail uh, because I got Google Glass, and so if I was to get my emails in uh-huh, Glass, I had you to use Google Glass, dude. That's hilarious. Yeah, and, so, and so I had <laughs> and I had to use Gmail. Prior to that, I was actually using the email uh, service, which is actually the webmail client was Roundcube, actually, and it was from my my domain registrar, uh, register for less. And I they just they offered me an email account that I could. It was a nominal fee, and they actually used uh, Roundcube for the webmail client, and I wasn't unhappy with it, but it wasn't a conscious decision. I didn't do research and and specifically choose them. It just happened to be what I was already registered with, so I clicked a button, and then I had email. And so I'd switched to Gmail for the past couple of years, and the I would I would run into little tiny problems. So for example. If I signed in from what Google calls a less secure device, if I did more than a certain amount of those, it would lock my account. And then I had to go back to my computer and sign in from a a location or an IP address, I guess, rather, that I had signed, that Google knew I existed on, and then I could unlock my account. And then once I signed in, I was good. And I would run into all these little irritating little problems with the the, the latest of which is everyone kept telling me that Google spam filtering is amazing. Gmail spam filtering is phenomenal. You just have to use it a while. And then once it gets to know you, it will stop throwing all of your really important email in the spam folder. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I I have been a, I have been a steady horse in telling it that this is not spam. This is not spam. This is Mm -hmm. not spam. And this week it literally cost me thousands of dollars because I missed an email and I was livid. 
Uh, and I, I, instead of just, I, there's no way to shut the spam filtering off. I can't just tell it, don't filter my, my freaking spam email and just put all of it in my inbox. I'd rather go and delete five messages and get the one important one. than you move that really basically what it's worked out for me is every important email winds up in spam. Really. It's not just this one thing. It's a whole series of events, but it really sounds like yeah. it's a matter of control and, and also a matter of just you not having a clear, like, you don't have the sense I have full jurisdiction over what's coming in my inbox. I don't have, like, a complete picture. I, you feel like mm -hmm. you just can't get to that. And if that that's really the root issue, it sounds like. So uh, so I'm dealing with I'm dealing with that issue and I'm not a happy camper when I get home that night because now I, now I have this I have this email that I didn't miss and it, it pissed a lot of people off, not to mention my, you know, essentially in a small town, you know, word gets around. So we screw something up. Everyone knows about it. And it was all because I missed this email. So I wasn't very happy. And I sit down and I'm eating dinner and I'm watching a frontline special on Edward Snowden. And there's a frontline special on, which is phenomenal, by oh, the way. Oh, man, it's on with that guy that has that most amazing voice ever, the, 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 the announcer. Yeah, it was it was a great special, and it was a it was a and and so I'm sitting there and I'm I'm, I'm eating my dinner and not very happy and uh, and through my kids screaming at the top of their lungs, I can hear little bits of of this of this special, and the guy starts talking about how Google has you know all the things that Google does to mine data and they store data and how originally they were going to be prosecuted because they weren't uh, the the privacy laws that they were violating you know are are so bad and if you it, it's no different than taking alligator clips and clipping it on. To somebody's phone line and that you would get thrown in jail but google is allowed to do this because they're not going to keep any of the data except wait now when snowden leaked the files we know they were keeping the data and i just i looked up and i'm like you know what i'm done i'm just i am done with google i'm going to find something else so i stayed up to like five in the morning i tried collab i tried a number of different email services what did and you think of collab collab was great except the amount of administration that you have to do to get it set up on your domain is it's a ton of work. It took me three hours of going back and forth with support. They, you have to create a specific DNS record that then they query to make sure that you actually own the domain mm -hmm. before they'll even let you change it. Like, here's the thing. Let me, you set everything up and just tell me where to point my MX record. And that should, that, as far as I'm concerned, is, is what we should do. But they have to, you have to create this text uh, record so that they can verify. And right. that whole process took like three hours. I wasn't very happy to begin with. But what they prevent you from doing is when I send emails out, you have my, you actually had my, my personal Gmail account, but I don't usually give that out. I give everyone my company email. And so it's important to me that when I, uh, when I send an email, it looks like it's coming from my company email. That way yeah. nobody has that, that yeah, personal yeah. one. And I, and, and I, and before everyone writes in, I am fully aware that if you look at the source, you, you can, you can, you can drag it out, but I'm all I'm trying to do is, is, is keep the honest people honest. They hit the reply button. It's going to come back to my, my work one and not bug the crap out of me. Uh, and most of the ones that I tried in Colab included would not let me do that. They, they specifically block you from sending from an address that isn't the address that you're actually using. Um, and so what I wound up with is Fastmail. Now, you and I had chatted with the Fastmail guys back at OSCON. And they kind of left an impression and I kind of filed that in the back of my brain of next time I, if I ever need a, a mail solution, this is something I'm going to look at. And I tell you what, I was blown away. We have a couple clients that are using Office 365 because it ties in pretty well with GoDaddy. And so that, that's just kind of the way they, mm -hmm. they, the way they've gone with that. And on Tuesday, I was setting up a the, Monday. I had this big problem and I was in a bad mood. Tuesday, I was working with a client and we were modifying some stuff on their Office 365 account. And I was struggling through that because the interface is just, it's a nightmare. And then I get to, uh, I get to Tuesday night where I'd finally uh, switched over to fast mail. And the entire time from the time I landed on their website till the time I had my inbox and my wife's inbox up and running, mapped my MX, the whole nine yards, yeah. like 15 minutes, 15 minutes and 25 bucks. It was OSCON that we had a chance mm -hmm. to interview the uh, guy behind, or one of the technicians at fast mail, I believe it was. And he told us that their infrastructure is running on Linux. You are you exposed to any of that when you're setting it up, or is it all through a web UI? What's that like? It it literally I went like you know, and that was the other thing too. With a couple of those other email, email services for my email, you should need my name, my credit card number, and if you really need it, I suppose a billing address, and that should be it. Yet some of those email services, my God, the amount of information that they are asking for, and the amount of time I spent filling out forms just to get email, just was ridiculous. I mean, just ridiculous. Uh, fast mail, like 15 minutes. I I entered in I entered in my credit card number. In fact, I don't even think I did that. I think the, I did it with a PayPal transaction, and I clicked on PayPal. And I submitted the transaction and I had, uh, I had logged into my, what they call the, uh, the, the master account and I logged into my master account 
took me 30 seconds to set up both of mine and my wife's email address. I was able to do my aliasing the way I wanted to. Uh, the whole thing was just beautiful. And they're the, 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 you know, they call it fast mail cause they say that they want to have uh, fast email and man, is that true from the, like the entire UI is laid out that I can find everything having never used it before. Everything was just very, very intuitive getting it set up to my, my mail client. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the email services, they'll include things for like Microsoft outlook and that's it. And then you have to go and parse that. Now these guys, they have something set up for Thunderbird, which there's, uh, which I ran into an issue and I'll get to in a second. All of the, all of the, they have just a, get, show me the, the server settings detail and they go, here's your IMAP, set, here's your IMAP server. So if you know what you SMTPs, need, just give it to If you know what you need, That's exactly, nice. which is great because I just bookmarked that so page. So do you mind asking, do you have a rough idea of what you're paying for fast mail? Tw- for- 20, 25 bucks for the year for both my wife and I. Okay. Which is a great deal if you ask me. And the web UI looks pretty nice. It's fantastic. Yeah. And, and we have, uh, they, they're, they're very serious about, uh, about privacy. They keep the minimum amount. I was reading on their, their, uh, their privacy agreement. They, I don't have it pulled up, but they, uh, they have, they keep the minimum amount of logs necessary to do troubleshooting. Um, they are an Australian based company, uh, Australian based company that is subject to Australian law, but they will not respond to U.S. court's orders. So if you have, if the U.S. court say, we want Mr. Chalai's email, they're going to tell them to screw off. Now, they do have a, uh, a data center in New York, um, so I don't know exactly how some of that w- would work, but all of their switching is done in New Zealand. Um, so, it, yeah, it, they're a really cool company. It well, offers am- uh, calendaring, too, so you guys can do shared yes. calendars. Yes. 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 So the, so I found out unbeknownst to me, Google. So a couple of things, we'll start with Thunderbird. Thunderbird, for whatever reason, you cannot change the order of accounts. And I never really wanted to do that until this week. And then I found out you can't like it, you know, you have all the accounts, you can't change the order. So you have to install an extension and then you can, and then with the extension, then you can change the order that I thought was a little silly. (laughs) And then the other thing I thought was that just kind of blew me away. Apparently Android doesn't support uh, CalDev, nor does it support Card dev. No, and so, I think what yeah. it is is the OEMs add it. Yeah, and yeah, you're right. Oh, and you're on a Nexus device now, right? Mm, so, so anyway, so it didn't have support. So I'm like, well, that's weird. So then, I, but the great thing about Fastmail is, by the way, their customer support is fantastic. I filled out a ticket because I I didn't know how to do it before the guy uh, before the guy could even respond, which by the way took like two minutes. I had already found it in their knowledge base, like, and I had Googled it before. I was tr- I was trying to figure it out, and uh, and I th- and I was like, well, I'm paying for it. I'll just I'll ask the guy. Maybe they have a quick way to get this specific thing to work. And they actually have a fast mail app for Android. I just prefer I to do everything. It. No, because so here's the thing. It looks kind of. I mean, it looks okay. It looks okay. Here's the problem. When I, especially when I switch to something new, I want to use it exactly how I used my last email. Yeah. And then that way I can do a true comparison because if I don't notice that, I, if I forget that I've switched, which has happened already, actually, I know that it's working for me. And in Fastmail's case, not only did I forget I switched, I forget I switched until something goes right that I was anticipating would be a problem. And then mm-hmm. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm not on Google anymore. That's not an issue. Uh, so like, for example, this, this afternoon when I was working with the support company, all of my support tickets, if I open a support ticket with the, with the company, they always get thrown into spam. I don't know why, but if it has like ticket number, blah, blah, blah on the subject line, it goes into spam. And today I got one of those emails. I'm like, well, son of a donkey. I didn't have to go (laughs) into my spam folder to dig that ticket thing out. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. So I can't say enough good things about fast mail, but my switch has been fantastic. And if you add those two extensions for the card dev and cal dev, uh, yeah, you can do shared calendar. And I, Ooh, my next yeah. step might be to just get off of Google Calendar altogether so, as well. Uh, Verdetta in the chat room says uh, there's a free, uh, he wants to know, oh, I, th- I think it was a question about archival support. He says he has emails going back to 2007. Uh, yeah. And I want to know if you, oh, it, oh it was, here we go. It was, it was Mr. Tampa. He says, I've got archived emails in, in Gmail that go back to 2007. How do I move history to fast mails? What did you do for that kind of stuff, like your old stuff? Here's the thing. I follow my own advice, the advice that I give to clients, and that is that email is not a is not data storage. That's not the place to to store all of your all of your data. I can't count the number of times I've gone to a client and they say, "Oh, well, I need my email." Well, why? Well, all, all I have I have back in in 2001 when we opened the place, all the blueprints for the thing. That's where I store them was in the email. I'm like, really, really? There's not a better way to do that. Once a year, I take my entire inbox and I pull all the e- I export all of my emails out and I store them as files on my file server. If that's not for you. 
I, I'm not exactly sure what. Mm. Oh, I, I tell you, here's what I would do. Here's what I would do. I would add both accounts into. I would add your exactly. Gmail account and your Fastmail account into Thunderbird, and then I would yep. just highlight all of them from Gmail and drag them into it's Fastmail. Dirty. It works. Yeah, but here's the thing. For people like the, the reason I kind of hesitated to say that is because for people like you, Chris. Um, I hope you have a dedicated computer to leave oh, yeah. on for a month. I wouldn't. I, I would just would take declare. That I would. I would just export it all. We've covered it way back in the past. An app that can that will. I uh, uh, think what it does is it downloads it to an inbox and then and then converts it to like an HTML page or something as an inventory. But there's oh, okay. a few, there's some backup apps that uh, some community members have created that do that. A couple other interesting things about Fastmail that you might want to play with at some point, Noah. I mean, and you probably already have solutions for this, perhaps. But uh, I guess it also includes uh, a Jabber server, so you could do XMPP chat. Oh no way! Yeah, yeah. And oh uh, man, oh we should try that and see if the what the video uh, support is like. Oh yeah, we should. Yeah, and it says, look right here. They have instructions for Pigeon under Linux to how to, how you set it up. No and, way. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of neat. And then something else I don't know if you'd really ever use, but they also offer a photo gallery support, so you can actually do like your own uh, web. Like if you just want to do, if you just want to share some photos and you don't want to have to upload it to a. Uh, to a public site, you could just, uh, I mean, not the fast mail is not public, but you were, you were making fun of me, but the first thing I did when I turned the Nexus on was shut off all the photo syncing photo stuff. Yeah, you did. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I wonder why. Uh, so if I, this, just as a disclaimer, uh, fast mail is not a sponsor. Um, they don't, they're not paying for advertising. This is just something Noah did this week. And, uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a roll your own solution. It's not something that Noah now has on his premise that is uh, all written using open source software. There is risk that Noah is taking by having mm -hmm. his personal mail, but I think considerably we, less than Google, though I would say. Yeah, and I think I think Fastmail is a pretty good reputation from what we when we grokked and we talked to them at uh, OSCON and liked what they said about their infrastructure and how they do things and how they contribute upstream to the IMAP projects and and they seem like a good they seem like a good open source citizen. So even though uh, Noah didn't roll it himself and uh, build it himself, uh, he appears to be uh, using um, a service from a company that is a good open source citizen. And I think that's kind of cool. Uh, and the other thing I like about them as somebody who wants to know what the hell's going on is they have a public status page, fastmailstatus.com, that gives you, like, what's going on, and it gives you a, a multi-day history of how their service has been, too. And this is the point I wanted to touch on, Noah, because, you know, you didn't really have a lot of oversight when you had Gmail, and I don't have a lot of no, oversight none. as Google Apps. And so now, not only do you have a phone number when you can call somebody and ask what's going on, and it sounds like you've actually gotten a pretty decent response, but and I like answer, that you, yeah. you also have, you know, this sort of general dashboard, which is kind of cool mm -hmm. too. Other services have it as well. And of course, if you rolled it yourself, you'd have some something like that. But, uh, so I don't know, stick with it, because that was something I was actually considering too. The other thing I was, the other thing I was considering, although I hadn't seen Fastmail's web UI, was actually using Fastmail as the back end and then using one of those uh, open source uh, web uh, Gmail killers as the front end. Like particularly, I was either thinking I could use Roundcube on top of Fastmail mm -hmm. or maybe, depending on how far along it's come, Rainloop, because Rainloop yeah. looks really, really cool. I'm, uh, I loaded up the demo while you were talking. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I spent a lot of time in the web UI this week because I was setting everything up, but truth be told, I know, I mean, okay, so with Google, I always signed into the web UI because I had to go into my freaking spam folder, which for whatever reason wouldn't sync to Thunderbird. But in Fastmail, I doubt I will spend much time in the web UI. I, other than setting things up, I haven't logged into it. I've oh, done everything okay. inside of Thunderbird oh, okay. and I have been, it has been a fantastic experience. Okay. Okay. I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I see, I, I actually, because I use so many different computers all the time. I only have one computer that actually has my email set up. Yeah, X to go, man. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Uh, you know what? This uh, this raindrop is not so bad. Not so bad. Pretty cool. So there you go. Uh, we'll have uh, more information in the show notes over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Just look for episode 382. And uh, let us know what you've deployed. You can go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com, find the feedback thread for 382, and tell us your solution. And uh, I've had different people uh, actually even create logins for me to try out their webmail solution. So eventually... I might do something. One thing that I am uh, really starting to appreciate a lot more as I have been uh, living in a trailer uh, trying on da remote data connectivity is actually downloading things locally, and that is uh, giving me more momentum to move off of webmail. I, I was just going to say, I logged into the, the, the advanced settings, and I just I Googled in their knowledge base uh, migrating. Guess what? They have a migration IMAP feature. So you put in the IMAP details of your old email client, and it will pull all of them right into Fastmail. There you go. <laughs> How cool is that? Yeah, that'll do it. That'll do the job. All right, that's the Linux Action Show's look at Noah's battle with Gmail. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. And Noah, 
Before we get into the email, I thought we'd check in on the name, the Mobile Studio poll, uh, because it's been going, the votes have continued throughout the episode, and Jupiter Rover continues to pull ahead with 45% of the votes. We are now clocking in at 200 and three votes. This has been a very fun process, and today, today has been one of the most humbling days uh, of the entire process because a uh, huge, uh, huge shipment of uh, wish list items came in, including thankfully two-way radios to make backing up much easier. And uh, I'm really thankful because uh, I, the, one of the bigger items that came in today, and I, I just can't even, I'm blown away, is a solar panel, uh, a solar panel starter kit. It's uh, you know, it's enough to trickle charge the batteries, and unfortunately, because of the way Amazon ships that one, they didn't include the uh, the name card with it, which is a bit of a bummer. Uh, but uh, there's a bunch of things that came in today, including an inverter and these two-way radios. So I'm saving all of the uh, thank you cards aside, and I hope to do a dedicated video to thank everybody to help make the road trip uh, uh, hopefully a real success. Because uh, I was just telling Noah that really what it freed me up to do is do items like uh, make the truck ready, or you know, actually get the trailer and get things bought for the rig that are sort of the essentials that are really big, huge, huge ticket items, $800 here, $300 here, $400 there, $500 here, $690 there. And so it's it really made something that was going to be maybe a little hokey pokey, not totally doable to something that I think when I get back from the road trip, if it all is pretty much a success, we're pretty much equipped and ready to go for another road trip, which is pretty, pretty great. Um, so thank you. And, uh, so I've been living out of the trailer as a, as a genuine learning experience, and I'm very glad I have before I hit the road. It's been great, and I've had to back it up uh, a couple of times without these two-way radios, and it's not not fun. My first time backing up the rig was at a gas station, which was challenging. Oh, no. Yeah. That's yeah. like the worst place ever. Yeah, I thought the chains were scraping the ground, so I wanted to pull over and check out, but then I was like, oh, but now I'm in a gas station. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what's funny? You will develop a sixth sense about that. Like, as you're pulling over, you'll be like, no, I'm not going to pull in there because I'd have to back out. Yeah, you'll, yeah. Eventually, oh, yeah. that'll come second nature. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to try not to make that mistake again. And then the other thing that I've learned is it is way, way easier to back into a spot on the driver's side yes. than it is on the passenger side. Because mm -hmm. essentially, on the passenger side, you're totally blind because the trailer blocks your view. And so yep. the first big camping spot I decided to park in was a back in on the passenger side, and we didn't have the radios, and so it was it was very stressful. <laughs> right? Yeah, back up to the right. No, yeah. the other right. Oh, I'm facing backwards. Wait, you're turning the wheel the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's and that's then, a lot of fun. And then because it's a narrow trail, there's like trees and brushes brushes in the way, and the, I've got the truck in four wheel drive because it's in the mud. And <laughs> Just, the good news is a lot of the new campgrounds that are that are being built lately are a lot of them are pull through. So you, yes. you pull in straight through, yeah. you stop, you drop your trailer off. Those are also known as the spots that go first. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Yeah, they really that go is, first. That is true. Uh, so the, the poll will be open for a little while, but I think Rover has it synced and it's a pretty good name. It's not bad. All right. So Drew writes in with an email about DigitalOcean. He says, I caught your show on YouTube a few times in the past a few months ago and I added your show to my podcatcher. I can't believe I hadn't done so sooner. I appreciate the show that can't. And I can follow without having to use my eyeballs. Oh, well, thanks. He says, uh, I'm just writing to thank you for introducing me to DigitalOcean. While I don't do any serious cloud-based stuff, once I signed up for a DO account, I realized it was perfect for tinkering. Uh, that's exactly cool. That's what I think, too. He says, I live in rural America where high-speed internet is serious luxury and have a droplet in, the, uh, in a cloud that I can use to SH and create a mail server and do other listings to help me feel better about the amount of time it takes to download ISOs, all the best, Drew. I realize that's exactly what I'm going to do in the trailer as I was reading this mm -hmm. email. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so we support a lot of uh, a lot of businesses that are on the outskirts um, that don't have very good internet, and I, I've done the exact same thing with DigitalOcean, and I, I just I laughed when I read it because I'm like, you know what? A lot of people are doing that. They 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 take DigitalOcean, they go, well, it's so much faster to download stuff on my on my droplet than it is for yeah. me to do here. That and the just only, makes more the sense. only thing I could see being a real issue with DigitalOcean would be my storage. So I'd be curious to know, like, are people using SSHFS to augment that or what? So uh, LinuxActionShow.reddit.com, what do you do? Because that would be the, the major downside to the VPS is like, you know, because I don't need more than a $5 rig to do something like that, but I only have 20 gigs of storage. So that would be the challenge. Uh, but I'd be, I bet there's a way to solve that problem. And before you jump to the other one, Noah, I was just to expand on that. I was going to say, I think to make it work really well, though, I still would want, want a local Linux server in the, uh, in the trailer as well to cache to. <laughs> you just want that because you want to say that yeah. your trailer has yes. a Linux server. It has nothing to do with yeah, caching. I'm also, no, I was also, no, speaking of caching, I was thinking of running Squid Proxy Server on there and using it to cache the web data uh, and also a local DNS resolver. Anything I can do to make it faster. So I don't, so mm -hmm. I'm not sending DNS 
over the uh, MiFi connections. Yeah, I'm telling yeah. you now, this isn't going to work for this trip because there's no time. But I'm telling you, a little like uh, a little Linux router and a DNS server and a proxy server would probably save me a couple of megabytes a month, maybe 10, 20 megabytes a month even. Especially Squid, especially Squid. That could save hundreds of megabytes. I'm just saying, and it's, and then if there's a way, oh man, what if I could do a forward cache on a DigitalOcean droplet? Oh my gosh, if anybody has done this, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. All right, that's just food for thought. You take Corey's email. All right, Corey writes in and he says, asking for cert. Hi guys, I have a full-time job working in a warehouse that runs Linux and they deploy AWS. I want that cert, but I don't know how to approach them. Any help would be appreciated, Corey. Well, Corey, if I were you, I would say the, the way I answer questions like this, the, the way I look at stuff like this is I reverse the rules. So if you were a, a manager for an IT company, what would you want to hear from your employee's mouth um, if, if they wanted to cert? First of all, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give the justification for the reason they should pay for the cert is because you want it. That will not be profitable, nor will they care. <laughs> I um, really, really want it. <laughs> so uh, what, I, what I would do is I would think to yourself, how is that beneficial to uh, to the company? Now, mind you, depending on the size of the company, um, we pay for certifications for employees and we're not even that big. Uh, so depending on the size of your company, you can get pretty creative with how it could be uh, with how it would be beneficial to them to pay you for a certification. The most basic approach would be something like, hey, listen, you know, here's the thing. I uh, I feel, you know, I'm, I'm a go getter. I'm a kind of person that has no problem using Google to research things um, and, and, and learn my way around these things. And, um, you know, I heard about this uh, this Linux Academy that and I signed up and I paid for that out of my own account. And, and I've, I've gotten made a little headway with uh, with AWS. The problem is I still feel like I don't have. Uh, I don't have all the answers to some of the problems that I encounter. And, and specifically, I feel like I could also really use the confidence boost to really know I'm doing things correctly. So I know I'm not going to just hose our prediction, our production infrastructure. Um, if, if I were to go, uh, up, uh, you know, apply for this certification, pay for it out of my pocket would be, would that be something that you would reimburse me um, when I complete the certification and, and pass it, pass it successfully? And if somebody came and asked me that, as long as it was in, as long as it was the technology that we were using, we'd do that. We would reimburse them. And like I said, we're we're a very small company comparatively speaking. So if you're working in a if you're working in a warehouse or you're working of any company of size, I would imagine they'd have no problem reimbursing you for a certification for working on a technology that they're using on a on a, on a daily basis, especially if it's crucial to their infrastructure. Yeah, I I I, I just second all of that. Very well said, Noah. Um, hey, so, you know, I realized uh, before we wrap up, this is the last show of the Linux Action Show I'm doing in the studio. And uh, so for a while. And so uh, do you want to just take a minute and tell people about this, the mobile studio you're building and why it's so damn cool? So basically what had happened was we were, we were sitting down, we were chatting about, uh, about you going on the road. And, um, and, and I said something to the effect of, you know, it'd be really cool is like, uh, is, is how is, is the, is the the separation that's going to happen where you're going to be departed from your studio and so essentially get to do everything over again and then you made the comment you said yeah going mobile is this is kind of like this is kind of like the the first way that you have to really separate yourself and say, I'm going to see what can be done on Linux. Because that was kind of the original starting goal of this, right? To see how mm -hmm. much of this we could, you know, if we're going to do the mobile, maybe the mobile thing, we start that on Linux and then propagate those changes back to JB1 if they're successful. And I said, all right, well, so I'm, of course, on board with all this. So I'm already online, start researching um, different components. Now, when the, the goal, the overreaching goal was it had to be something that is super, super compact because I can't, you can't be dragging stuff out and putting stuff away. It has to be basically set the box on the table yeah. and get on the it's air. living space as well. Right. Second problem is you don't have access to 100 volt, uh, 120 volts. Now, if you have an inverter, I might supply you with some of the AC inverter or AC adapters so that you can plug in if you want. Mm. But basically it all has to be battery powered. Um, now that's particularly problematic uh, as I found out when it comes to mixers, because I was aware that they had DC powered mixers. So I thought I could just simply uh, put a converter on it and uh, a voltage a transformer, step the voltage up, step the voltage down, we'd be set. Turns out that's really difficult to do because even if you're not using it, the the mixer is designed to support 48 volt phantom power. And so of course we're going from 12 to 48 volts. It's a big jump. Um, and so I had all these little problems that I was sorting out and I finally got, the, basically before I even left Seattle, I basically had an idea in my head and I said, you know, Chris, would you mind if, can I take, tackle this project? Can I give it a shot and see if I can come up with something that works for you? And he said, yeah, you know, give it a shot. And of course, 
I was thinking, and I think you were thinking that we had a little bit more time than we actually had. Sure and as it quick. turns out, yeah. all of, yeah, all of this stuff, most of the stuff came in this week, which when they originally told me they were going to get get it to me on the tenth, I thought they gave us plenty of time. Turns out, really, if you account for the 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 day it's going to take for me to get it from me to you, plus a day to test everything, make sure it works. Uh, really, we don't have that much time. So uh, we have. I, I found a uh, I found a DC battery operated mixer. I found obviously the the audio interface for the computer can run off the computer's power, so that's not necessarily a problem. And then I had to find a compressor and a gate that I could step down to 12 volts, so I could power it off of oh, man. off of the RV battery but still give you the same kind of audio quality. And so oh, I reached geez. out to an audio engineer friend of mine that does recording in, 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 a, in a Minneapolis studio. And I said, I need, I need a really good compressor, a really good gate that's going to sound amazing, but there's a catch it has to be uh, it has to be DC powered. He goes actually. He goes uh, uh, from the thousands of dollars of compressor uh, uh, processing equipment we use here at the studio. Here's the one that I use, and it just so happens to be DC powered. So I said, great, I need one. So I ordered one of those, and and that is the one last piece that I'm waiting on. Wow. Everything else is assembled, and then we have it that inside of out. a we have it inside of an SKB two U um, portable uh, case. So essentially everything it 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 it's it's a 19 inch case, but it it just looks like a little suitcase. It's small enough to set on top of a desk um, and you can actually they have little uh, little sticky things you can actually put on to set a laptop right on top of it if you want so it will it will occupy it will occupy very little surface area and at the same time it'll give you everything you need and you can run it either totally self-contained off of a battery or uh, I, I I think now that you have the inverter I will include the AC cords and then you can plug them all in if you choose to do yeah, that and you know also um, I might be at a site that has a power hookup there's a couple yeah, of right, we're gonna stay that has right. power hookups um, so everything would, so everything, everything is basically there and everything is tested. It, it cool. sounds Ooh. great. The only thing is obviously I'm extremely concerned about, um, about noise and without, and so that compressor uh, gate limiter has to be here, uh, before it's, it's a usable setup. Otherwise I, I, I'm just, I'm too afraid of, of background noise and stuff like that. Um, and that's supposed to get delivered. It might actually be downstairs right now for all I know and if not it'll be here on Monday and then I'm gonna overnight that to you uh, tomorrow and I love it there's there's a few things <laughs> that are to like, the wire. there's a few things that are like coming down to the wire but it usually it, it, it generally works out um, so I'm really excited to see that and when no and that gets here I'll and I get it in the rig I'll do a video on it I if you uh, eventually you'll be able to find these at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash rover um, right now you can go to YouTube and find the road trip playlist I actually just linked it in the feedback thread too, and that's where I'm posting these videos. I have three of them right now, and uh, when I run into challenges from time to time, I try to make a video out of it to let you guys know what I'm facing. It's kind of fun. It's been a good adventure, and like we were saying, there's some good gadgets and some good maker aspects and even some little Linux in there. Really excited to see what we can do with that. All right, so that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com if there's an open source project or a news story or an item you want us to take a look at or some feedback for this episode, that's where you do it. And Noah, you want to send anybody to any places throughout the week? Yeah, you can run over to altaspeed.com. I actually have a, a, a small project. I can't say a whole lot about it yet, um, but hopefully I, I, it will be, if nothing else, it will be a really, really great thing to put inside of the where do you want to send people <laughs> during the week because I'll actually have a, a specific uh, community, uh, a community-oriented Linux project that, that I'm working on. Hopefully we'll have more details about that in a little bit. For, for the time being, Altaspeed. Yeah, you actually know what it is. Yeah, it's very <laughs> but, nice. Uh, nobody else does. All right, check it out. You can follow me on Twitter at Chris LES. That'll be probably very useful during the road trip. Also, follow the network at Jupiter Signal for news feeds. Even if you don't use Twitter, you can go there and check it out for news feeds and changes just you read only. And follow us live. Won't you go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to see the live times in your local time zone, and you can find that at jblive.tv. Audio and video are over there. Also, you can get uh, the RTMP RTS stream, drop that right in MPV or VLC, and just bypass Flash altogether. All right, everybody, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, and we'll see you right back here next week. So, um, Odyssey Westra is gonna is offered to help do some of the social meetup arrangement stuff. Oh, good. And uh, I got a SilverCloud uh, tracker. Are you familiar with SilverCloud? Uh-uh. So it's a dedicated GPS. It's got a GPRS for si signal connectivity and GPS uh -huh. for uh, tracking. And it basically looks like a radar detector. Like if a cop pulled me over, uh -huh. he would undoubtedly think it's a radar detector. But it's hmm. not. It's a, it's, a, it's a GPS tracking device that goes back and does real-time map updates. So I'm going to have a URL for the audience to be able to watch us where we're and, at in real time. And where, and where does that go? That, that like, like it connects Bluetooth with your phone or something? Or? No, no. That's why I got it. It's a totally standalone 
unit. He uses oh, GPRS okay. cellular connectivity to, to transmit back to huh. their service. So does it uh, does it use? Um, do you have to pay like a monthly fee, or is it once yeah. you bought it? Oh. No, there's a monthly fee depending on how frequently you want updates. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, but the but the idea is is like so if we wanted to like if Odyssey Wester wanted to he could <laughs> actually go into the admin interface. I could give him a login, and then he yeah. could get notifications when we arrive in different areas, so he could set mm -hmm. up meetups and stuff in that spot. Mm -hmm. Um, but the other thing it's going to give me is it's really meant for fleet management. So the other thing it's going to give me after the road trip is a complete report of everywhere we went, our speeds, where we stopped, our elevations, uh, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm -hmm. so.